Just like some integrals in the xy plane are nicer in polar coordinates, which we already looked at, it's true that there are some integrals in three dimensions, in R3, that just look nicer in other coordinates other than Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z. One set of coordinates is called cylindrical coordinates. Um, those are actually pretty easy for us now that we know polar coordinates in the xy plane. So cylindrical coordinates are just, instead of x and y, use polar coordinates in the xy plane, and z stays z. So um, we'll start with a couple of examples of that, though they shouldn't seem too bad, having done polar coordinates already. Spherical coordinates are really different. You give yourself distance from the origin in R3. Um, you have an angle theta, which in some sense is the same theta as polar coordinates, but I have to explain what that means. And you have an angle phi, which is measured from the positive z-axis. And we'll do a couple of examples of integrals in spherical coordinates too. But <clears throat> Let's start with cylindrical coordinates. And it just means that a point is specified, uh, a point is specified a point in space. It's specified by r, theta, and z, where, as I said, r and theta, you should just think of as polar coordinates in the xy plane, and, and z is just z. So again, when we're doing integrals in three dimensions, we typically assume r is greater than or equal to zero. Theta, you can take between um, zero and two pi or really any range of theta values that are it's 2 pi long. And z is just the z coordinate, so it can be any real number. So what this means is that your x coordinate, if you want to translate back into Cartesian coordinates, x is r cosine of theta, y is r sine theta, and z is z which may seem kind of silly, but yeah, just to emphasize nothing changes with z. Um, and it's true, just like in polar coordinates, that if you square this and square this, x squared plus y squared is r squared, which you frequently use. And then there's the question of, what does a little element of volume look like? So an infinitesimal chunk of volume, which is usually called an element of volume in cylindrical coordinates. Well, in rectangular Cartesian coordinates, it's dx, dy, dz. But in cylindrical coordinates, well, you think you should think um, it's a little, a little chunk of area in the xy plane. In fact, maybe to make this match more, put this z on the inside and the x on the outside. You should think, oh, yeah, it's just a dz times a little chunk of area in the xy plane, but then you write this little element of area in the xy plane in terms of r and theta, like we know you can, so that you get, oh, dz times, and then dA is just like it was in polar coordinates, r d r d theta. We typically like for non-infinitesimal variables to be on the inside, so all right, r dz dr d theta, and of course these differentials could be in any order. It depends on how your region is described, so maybe um, it's kind of more normal to say r dr d theta dz, but in fact in most of the integrals it's the z that you'll want on the inside, or at least most of the easy ones. So let's just look at an example. Example. Um, find the volume. So let me draw the region and then describe it. So I'm going to take a sphere, it's a sphere of radius 8 centered at the origin. So I'm going to write 8 down here. And what I want to do is take the cone, so this is, this is described by x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals, ah, no, I wanted, I'm sorry, I wanted the square root of 8. 
equals the square root of 8 squared, so equals 8 to match the example in the book. And then I want the cone, I want to take a look at the cone where z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. So what we'd like to do in this problem is you take a look at the sphere of radius the square root of 8 centered at the origin in R3. You take a look at the cone z equals, or the half cone, z equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. And we'd like to find the volume of this snow cone-like region that's above the cone and below the hemisphere, the top hemisphere um, here. So yeah, this is nicely set up for cylindrical coordinates. And it, this is just like things we looked at in Cartesian coordinates. We're going to project down into the xy plane and the projected region will be the inside of this disk or the inside of this circle, so this disk, that's, that's the projected circle where the cone intersects the sphere. So you get this projected region down in the xy plane and really the triple integral that we'll set up really is nothing new for us because after we project down into the xy plane we'll simply use polar coordinates to to integrate over this this disk. So what do you do? You just take the volume, you integrate 1 times dv to get volume, so the volume is the triple integral over our solid snow cone S of just 1 dv. I didn't call it S in my diagram, but that's what I'm calling the, the solid region that we're trying to find the volume of. And what you do is you write this as a double integral over the disk in the xy plane of, and you'll have dz on the inside. Right? You write volume as dz times dA. Volume is just dz times dA. And we need, for each point in our projected region, we need to integrate from one z-coordinate to the next. Well, the lower z-coordinate is the z-coordinate on the cone, which is x squared plus y squared. And the upper z-coordinate is the z-coordinate of the hemisphere, and it's the square root of 8 minus x squared minus y squared. Now, you may wonder why I'm writing things in terms of x and y. Well, that's how they were given in the problem. But if we decide now to integrate over the region R, which is that disk in the xy plane, if we decide to do that in polar coordinates, which would mean doing the whole integral in cylindrical coordinates, then yes, we'll need to change x and y to things in terms of R and theta, which is what we're going to do. But first we need to find what that disk is, the disk where, so it's the inside of the circle where the cone meets the sphere, well that means we need for these z coordinates to be the same. So if we square both sides, we need x squared plus y squared to equal 8 minus x squared minus y squared. If you put these terms over here, you get 2 times x squared plus y squared equals 8. So x squared plus y squared equals 4. So the circle is the circle of radius 2 centered at the origin, and our region R is the disk inside of that. So our region R is the inside of this disk of radius 2. And we are going to do everything in cylindrical coordinates, which means using polar coordinates for R. So what we get, all right, x squared plus y squared is R squared. Square root of r squared, we're assuming r is greater than or equal to 0, so that's just r. 
This is the square root of 8 minus r squared dz dA. We write as r dr d theta, but I'm going to move the r all the way inside. r dr d theta, just like it was for polar coordinates. Um, you could leave the r out here. It's just for aesthetics that I like it to the left of all the differentials. Um, and then our limits of integration on r and theta just need to take us over this disk of radius 2 centered at the origin. Well, that's easy. It means r goes from 0 to 2 and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. So this is the, the iterated integral that we need to perform. And it's not bad. You just do it. You get whatever you get. You get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 2. Um, the integral of r with respect to z, you get rz. You need to evaluate as z goes from r to z equals the square root of 8 minus r squared. We still need to integrate with respect to r and then with respect to theta. So what we get So what we get is the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 2. You get r times the square root, I'll write to the 1 half, 8 minus r squared to the 1 half um, minus r squared. And then you get dr. And then d theta. So what do you get for this? Um, this inside, this part of the integral, you'll need to do by substitution. You can do it off to the side. Substitution will work nicely. You get, we need to integrate r8 minus r squared to the 1 half dr. If you make the substitution u equals 8 minus r squared, then du is minus 2r dr, so minus 1 half du is r dr. This integral becomes, this is u to the 1 half. The r dr is minus 1 half du. You pull out the minus 1 half, you get minus 1 half. You add 1 to the exponent divide by the new exponent. And well, since I've written an indefinite integral, put in a plus c. You invert this, so you get minus a third. Um, so when you invert that, and you put back in that u is 8 minus r squared. So what you find is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of, we get minus 1 third 8 minus r squared to the 3 halves minus r cubed over 3. This is evaluated as r goes from 0 to 2. And then we still have to integrate with respect to theta. Well, this will just give us a number. And then you integrate that with respect to theta. Well, you pull out that constant. The integral of d theta is just theta. You evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. So you're going to get 2 pi times whatever this is. Um, and so you put in 2. So you get minus 1 third. And then when you put in 2, when you put in 2, you get 4 to the 3 halves. And you put 2 in there, and you get 8 minus 8 thirds. And you subtract what you get at 0. At 0, this part is 0, but this part is not. It better not be. We better not get a negative volume. So you get minus minus. So you get plus one third, and then an eight to the three halves. So this, um, we can write this a little more neatly. This is the square root of four is two. Two cubed is eight. So that's minus eight thirds. Eight thirds minus eight thirds, minus sixteen thirds. So we can write 
2 pi, and then you get 1 third, and then, well, um, you, can, you can take the square root of 8 and get, well, it's 2, it's, um, two times the square root of 2, and then cubed, so 16 times the square root of 2. Uh, so um, I'm getting 1 third times 16 times the square root of 2. Right? Did I do that correctly? So square root of 8, 2 times the square root of 2, cubed 8 times a 2 times, a, yes, 16 times square root of 2. Um, and then we got minus 8 thirds. You can pull out an 8 thirds. That would be nice. And so what I'm getting, if I pull out an 8 thirds, is 16 pi over 3 times 2 times the square root of 2 minus 1. Um, okay. So that's what I'm getting. Uh, that looks slightly wrong. So now I need to try to find where it's, <laughs> where it's slightly wrong. Looks like it. Oh, I said it and I wrote it wrong. We had an eight third, a minus eight thirds, minus eight thirds. It was minus 16 thirds. I think I said that. I never wrote it. And then we can factor out a 16 thirds and get 32 pi, 32 pi over three times the square root of two minus one. Phew, that looks a lot better. All right. So that's what we get 32 thirds over 32 thirds times the square root of 2 minus 1. Um, you know, it's not a particularly attractive answer, but the integration's not bad. Yeah, we had to do a substitution, but you should know how to do substitutions. All right, so that's one example of how to integrate in cylindrical coordinates. Um, let's look at one more before we use spherical coordinates. Let's look at kind of a, a weird one that's, that's designed to to look weird and kind of unapproachable in anything other than cylindrical coordinates. It's uh, very difficult to draw. Fortunately, you don't have to draw the solid region to do the problem. So my next example, I would like to calculate the triple integral over some solid region S of 1 over the square root of x squared plus y squared dv, where, let me write it down here, where S is, S is the region actually let me, let me hold off on defining S. Let R be the region in the xy plane, because this will help me describe what S is. So in the xy or R theta plane, in the xy plane, described in polar coordinates by Um, theta is between 0 and pi, and r is between 1 plus theta squared and 1 plus theta plus theta squared. And let s be the region And S is the solid region above R bounded by the plane where Z equals 1 and the half cone where z equals 1 plus 2 times 
the square root of x squared plus y squared. All right. <laughs> How much of this do you need? Do you need to draw? Well, not so much. Um, it would be nice to have an idea of what this region R looks like. Um, you don't have to because it's described for you completely right here. But it's kind of nice as you are as theta increases from 0 to pi, 1 plus theta squared increases from 1 to 1 plus pi squared. So you are looking at a spiral that starts when theta is 0. When theta is 0, you start at 1. So. Here you are at a distance of 1 when theta is 0. And then it kind of spirals outward. Or it doesn't kind of spiral outward. It gets bigger. And the other, the other R, so this is supposed to be a picture of R equals 1 plus theta squared. Theta, your angle starts at 0 and R is 1. And as theta increases, your distance from the origin increases until you get to over here, you get to, oh, now my other one's not going to fit on there. So let me draw this smaller. So it, here to 1 plus pi squared. But if you're writing the actual x coordinate, it would be negative 1 minus pi squared. Um, so this is the curve where r equals 1 plus theta squared. 1 plus theta plus theta squared, well, you just add an extra theta to it. So as r increases, this again, this when theta 0 also starts at 1, but it's always bigger. It comes over here to minus 1 minus pi minus pi squared. And the region that we're looking at is r, is what's trapped in between those curves. As I said, it is not, it is not important, really, for you to draw the region r. Um, I'm doing that just so you'll have some idea. But one of the nice things about you know, understanding calculus is Sometimes when the pictures are very difficult, you don't need them. And it's kind of a waste of time on a test, anyway, to draw them. It's not a waste of time if you've got all the time in the world. But. And then, so what's the solid region that we're integrating over? You take the plane where z is 1. So here's where z is 1. And then there's a cone. There's the cone z equals 1 plus 2 times the square root of x squared plus y squared, right? You should recognize z equals x squared plus y squared is, well, half a cone. And then when you multiply it times 2, that's just a change of scale on the z-axis. And you add 1, it gets lifted up so that the cone starts on this plane. And so you've got this cone up here. And what region are we looking at? All right, that region R in the xy plane is down here. And what you're trying to picture, it's hard to draw this in perspective, is the stuff that's above this plane and below this cone, above this region R in the xy plane. So it's some solid region trapped between the plane and the cone and whose projection into the xy plane is R. That's all you need to know. You don't need to spend a lot of time drawing this solid thing. You can just go, oh, well then, this is the triple integral. But we can immediately write it as an iterated integral of, well, in, in cylindrical coordinates, x squared plus y squared is r squared. So this is 1 over the square root of r squared. r is greater than or equal to 0. This is 1 over r. dv is r dz dr d theta. Our z is going, starting at 1 and goes up to 
z equals 1 plus 2 times the square root of x squared plus y squared, that's 1 plus 2r. Right? That's z equals 1 plus 2 times the square root of x squared plus y squared. The square root of x squared plus y squared is r, so that's just z equals 1 plus 2r. Your r coordinates, well, r goes from 1 plus theta squared to 1 plus theta plus theta squared. And theta goes from 0 to pi. So it's not bad. You know, it's rigged so that the 1 over r and the r cancel each other. You just, that multiplies to 1. And so you just have that, that iterated integral to do. It's not particularly attractive. It's not that ugly. So what do you get? You get the integral from 0 to pi, the integral from 1 plus theta squared to 1 plus theta plus theta squared. And then on the inside you had the integral of just dz, so that's just a z. You get z evaluated as z goes from 1 to z equals 1 plus 2r. And then after that we have to integrate with respect to um, with respect to r, and then with respect to theta. So you get the integral from 0 to pi, the integral from 1 plus theta squared to 1 plus theta plus theta squared. You get 1 plus 2r minus 1, so you just get 2r dr d theta. 2r dr integrates to r squared, so you get integral from 0 to pi, you've got r squared evaluated from 1 plus theta squared to 1 plus theta plus theta squared. And then you still have to integrate with respect to theta. You get the integral from 0 to pi of 1 plus theta plus theta squared squared minus 1 plus theta squared squared d theta. All right, now we have a single integral to do. This is really a calc 1 problem at this point, you know, a, a single variable calculus problem. What you could do is square all, this all the way out, which is slightly ugly, then square this, cancel terms, and combine. Um, I'll go ahead and finish the integral, but I'll do it in a slightly sneaky way. I'll factor this as the difference of squares. Um, that makes it significant, well, Significant, slightly easier. If I factor this as the difference of squares, it's this quantity minus that quantity. Well, the 1 plus theta squareds cancel, and you just get theta, times this quantity plus that quantity, which is 2 plus theta plus 2 theta squared d theta, which means had I expanded all of this and canceled stuff, what I'd end up with would be the integral from 0 to pi of 2 theta plus theta squared plus 2 theta cubed d theta. And then you just use the power rule and plug in pi and subtract what you get at 0. This will not be good board organization, but I'm going to try to fit the answer right in there. I get theta squared plus theta cubed over 3, so theta squared, theta cubed over 3, and then plus, you get a theta to the f 2 times theta to the 4th over 4, so plus theta to the 4th over 2, evaluated from 0 to pi, so you plug in pi and subtract what you get at 0, so you get just pi squared plus pi cubed over 3 plus pi to the 4th over 2. You can factor out a pi squared, you can get a common denominator, but that's the answer. I just leave it like that. All right, so um, that's just an example of two examples of how you use cylindrical coordinates. And in those examples, at least in the second one, it was supposed to be blatantly obvious you'd want to use, um, I think I said polar coordinates, so cylindrical coordinates. Um, the first one, 
after we go over spherical coordinates, you might think, oh, wouldn't that be nicer in spherical coordinates? And the answer is yes, it would be. And we're going to do it again. We're going to find the volume of the snow cone again, but using spherical coordinates. Um, but yeah, I mean, the point is, you should recognize when something is more manageable in cylindrical or spherical coordinates than in Cartesian coordinates. Um, you might have a choice sometimes about whether to use Cartesian, cylindrical, or spherical. And sometimes they're kind of equally easy, but sometimes it's much, much easier to use one instead of the other. So um, let's talk about spherical coordinates. It's spherical coordinates are really different for us. It's a three-dimensional version of using polar coordinates, but you don't have a, a Z, you don't use Z anymore. Instead, you have a, you talk about distance from the origin and set up things more or less completely differently. All right, so here is x, y, z space, R3. We want to take a point in space, and we want to describe its spherical coordinates. So how do you describe the location of a point in space in spherical coordinates? Well, you draw a ray from the point to the origin. You could do this for any point other than the origin itself. We'll, I'll say what happens at the origin. I mean, it'll follow from the equations. So what do you specify to specify the location of that point in spherical coordinates? One of the things is you specify the distance from the origin. So we call this distance rho. Then another thing you specify, so rho will be greater than or equal to zero. It's, it's really distance, not with a plus or minus sign. Phi is the measure that the angle that that ray makes with the positive z-axis measured <laughs> down from the z-axis. So, um, and you only, but you only do this going down to pi, down to here. To get other points, you rotate around, and we'll talk about that coordinate in a minute. So you've got this phi that's between zero and pi. And then what do you do? You drop a perpendicular into the xy plane. Now, that is supposed to be a perpendicular in perspective. So that's supposed to be a perpendicular into the xy plane. Maybe I'll put phi here and rho here so that I can draw here. That is supposed to be a right angle in perspective. You you project that ray out to the point into the xy plane. Well now, once you're in the xy plane, you've got theta here from polar coordinates or cylindrical coordinates, and you've got a distance r, the distance from the origin r in the xy plane. And now you can write, you can write all the transformation equations that you want to go back and forth from rectangular to cylindrical to polar coordinates. All right, this is supposed to be in perspective. This, post, this line segment and this line segment are supposed to be parallel in the same length. So that, um, that's rho, and this is a right angle. All right, then, then what? What is this z coordinate? Well, here's phi, so phi is right, let me get this out of the way. Here's the angle phi, this distance is rho. So yeah, the cosine of phi, uh, I don't know what rho is doing up there. Uh, that distance would be r. Oh, that was part of my leftover coordinates, I think. Um, so, the cosine of phi would be the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. So the z coordinate is rho cosine of phi. 
So that's easy. Well, the sine of phi should be the opposite side over the hypotenuse. So um, if you multiply, you get r, r, this kind of polar distance after you project, r is rho sine of phi. So let me write that. R is rho sine of phi. But then, once you're down here in the xy plane, um, oh, I should have said theta can be anything between 0 and 2 pi. So, but you don't need to include 2 pi since you're back where you are at 0. Once you're down in the xy plane, we know that x is r cosine of theta and y is r sine of theta. So you get um, x is r cosine of theta, but r is rho sine phi. So you get rho sine phi cosine of theta. And y is r sine theta, but r again is rho sine phi. So this is rho sine phi sine theta. So spherical coordinates for the point, you specify rho, theta, and phi, and you give a rho, theta, and phi, um, where rho is greater than or equal to zero, phi is between zero and pi, theta is between zero and two pi. Those are called the spherical coordinates of the point, the rho, the theta, and the phi. And here's how you, the theta is the same theta from cylindrical coordinates. If you want the r from cylindrical coordinates, it's just rho sine phi. The z is rho cosine of phi, and if you want to go another step to the Cartesian coordinates, then you just use x is r cosine of theta and y is r sine of theta, and you get this. So, okay, good, good. So that's how you take, you know, when you have x, y, and z in a problem, how you translate into rho, theta, and phi. It's true, rho is distance from the origin, which by the Pythagorean theorem, twice means Another thing we use all the time is rho squared is certainly x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Um, it's a good exercise <laughs> to do to actually square this, square this, square this, and make sure you can reduce that to rho squared. You'll use the fundamental trig identity twice. Um, we need dv in spherical coordinates, and that is not easy. <clears throat> it's... But if you understand where rho, theta, and phi are, and if you just picture a little chunk of volume, an infinitesimal chunk of volume corresponding to a small, an infinitesimal change in rho, an infinitesimal change in theta, and an infinitesimal change in phi, it's not too bad to see what dv is. So we will have, we're at some point, Actually, yeah, we're at some point in spherical coordinates. We let phi change a little bit. So here's a small change in phi. Yeah, like I'm going to be able to fit this in here. d phi. Um, this distance is rho. You also let rho grow a little bit. I have to draw this fairly large so that you'll be able to see it. But here's a small Here's a small change in rho. And then we need to have the projected, we need to, to project this. Let me do it out here. You need to project this into the xy plane. And here's theta. Here's theta. And then you want to have a small change in theta. So, Um, in perspective, we want something roughly, well, roughly like that. Um, when you drop these perpendiculars into the xy plane, a small change in theta would be here, d theta. 
All right. So our question is, what's, what's the volume of that little curvy chunk out there that has one side D rho, one side that, and one side this? Well, it's not so bad. One side is D rho. This arc length is, well, they, <coughs> phi is measured in radians. So that arc length is rho d theta. So this side has length rho d, uh, did I say theta, d phi. It has length rho d phi. What about this side? Well, that's the same as this. And what is that? Well, it's that is r d theta. But r, remember, r is rho sine phi d theta. So that this side is rho sine phi d theta. And if you multiply this times this times this, you get what an infinitesimal chunk of volume is. So what the volume element is in spherical coordinates. There is, I should say, and it's in the more depth part of the section, you can do this more analytically. There's a formula. You just take the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian of the change of coordinates map and you get this without having to draw pictures and without looking at things, but this is intuitively how you get it. Um, so what we get is we get a row times a row, so you get a row squared, you get a sine phi, and then you get a d rho, d phi, d theta. So you get rho squared sine phi, d rho, d phi, d theta. And that's what an infinitesimal chunk of volume, so the volume element is in spherical coordinates. Yeah, it's not easy to remember all this. Um, you sometimes have to draw the picture to remind yourself what everything is, but um, let's, it's, it's worth it because some integrals become so much easier in spherical coordinates. So let's just do two volume integrals, and in later sections where we look at more applications, we'll do other integrals in spherical coordinates. But let's just set up a couple of volume integrals in spherical coordinates and see how things look. So let's take an eighth of a sphere. So let's, or so an eighth of a ball. We're going to take a sphere of radius, just r. So we're going to take a sphere of arbitrary radius r, but then I only want to take the and fill it in, so it's, it's a solid ball, but then I only want to take the portion in the first octant, so where x, y, and z are all positive. And I want to verify that we get what you hopefully know is the volume or one-eighth of what you know is the volume of a sphere of radius r. I've decided most of my sphere is in the way. So, so I want you to picture this as the eighth of the sphere that's in the first octant in xyz space. And we would like to call this the solid region S. And we'd like to take the triple integral over s of just 1 times dv to get the volume and make sure that what we're getting is 1 8 what you hopefully know is the volume of the sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed. So that means, so this is our question, is this what we're going to get? This is 1 6 pi r cubed. Do we get that? And what the reason I want to do this really simple example, spherical coordinates are set up to integrate nicely, really, over balls. And so this, if this one's not easy, none of them are going to be easy. On the other hand, if you see how to do this one, they're all, most of them are not too bad. So OK, well, we just said dv is rho squared sine phi d rho, d phi, d theta. Now it's just a question of what limits of integration we need to take us over this eighth of a, of a ball. 
So it's filled in. It's not, you know, it's the region trapped between the sphere and the XY, uh, the three coordinate planes, the XY plane, the XZ plane, and the YZ plane. So, all right, let's do rho certainly goes from zero out to R. We have all points at all those radii. Phi, you may not be used to thinking about phi, but phi goes from zero up here at the z-axis down to the phi in the xy plane. But that's phi equals pi over two. So phi is going from zero to pi over two. Theta is every place, you know, if you project this into the xy plane, all the angles that you get, well, that's clearly all the angles in in the first quadrant, well, that's between 0 and pi over 2 again. So this is the, the triple integral, the iterated integral that we want to do. And yeah, the limits of integration are all constants. You know, chunks of, chunks of a ball centered at the origin are very easy in spherical coordinates. And then you just integrate it and you get whatever you get. Oh, well, we better get 1, 6 pi r cubed, but Let's see. So we get the integral from 0 to pi over 2, the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of your first integral is with respect to rho. You get rho cubed over 3 times the sine of phi evaluated as rho goes from 0 to r. And then you still have to integrate with respect to phi and with respect to theta. OK? So we get, when we plug in rho as r, we get r cubed over 3. Subtract what you get when rho is 0, which is 0. So you just get r cubed over 3 sine of phi. But r cubed over 3 is a constant. We can pull it all the way out of the integral. So we get r cubed over 3, and we're left with the integral from 0 to pi over 2, the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the integral of sine phi d phi d theta. The integral of sine of phi is minus the cosine of phi. So you get minus the cosine of phi evaluated from 0. I don't know when this became a pi over 3. <laughs> you evaluated from 0 to pi over 2, and we still have to integrate with respect to theta. The cosine of pi over 2 is 0. The cosine of 0 is 1, but we get minus minus 1, so we just get a 1. So we get r cubed over 3 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of 1 d theta. That just gives us a theta evaluated from pi over 2 to 0. That's pi over 2. We get r cubed over 3 times pi over 2 which is 1 6 pi r cubed. Whew. Good. <laughs> That's what we were supposed to get. What did we just do? We just verified that the volume of an entire inside of a sphere of radius r is 4 thirds pi r cubed because we figured out an eighth of it is 1 6 pi r cubed. All right, I just want to do one more example in spherical coordinates. I want to go back to the snow cone that we looked at in cylindrical coordinates and see that it's actually easier in spherical coordinates. So I want to go back and look at our snow cone. So Recall that we had a sphere centered at the origin of radius, well, let me draw the radius down here. Its radius was the square root of 8. And then we had a cone this cone was where z equal the square root of x squared plus y squared. And we were looking at the volume of this solid snow cone-y looking thing inside. 
And we did this in, in cylindrical coordinates, but now let's find the volume in spherical coordinates. Well, again, the volume, and you can go ahead and write something that has very little content. If you call that solid region S, you know, it's the triple integral over S of 1 dV, that basically saying nothing except what the definition of volume is, that you add up all the little chunks of volume. But we want to do this in spherical coordinates. And dV, as we know, is rho squared sine phi d rho d phi d theta. But now the question is, what are our limits of integration? So rho, no matter what your, no matter where you are, your rho starts at zero and goes out to the square root of eight. So that's not a problem. And at any point, your thetas go all the way around, meaning that, yeah, if those, those points are on there, well, if you, if you rotate around the z-axis, which means down in the xy plane, you'd be rotating the projected line segment all the way around. So your theta is certainly going from 0 to 2 pi. And then the question is, what is phi doing? And it may not be clear to you, but, well, I mean, phi is going from the z-axis down to this edge of the cone. You know, so the boundary of the cone, z, so phi measures the angle between the positive z-axis and the ray, and it should go from here to whatever that is. And then theta takes you around this way, but it goes from there to there. Now, maybe it's obvious to you that that's pi over 4, just from some symmetry consideration. Maybe it's not. I'm going to put it in, and then I'm going to explain it another way. How could you see that this cone, the claim is that this cone is precisely where phi equals pi over 4. And the question is, how do you see that? But if you believe that for a second, then certainly your phi's are going from zero, and every place you've got points in your solid region, phi is between zero and pi over four. If it's not obvious to you, or in another example, maybe where you'd have to figure something out, how do you figure out that this is where phi is pi over four? It's not particularly difficult. Remember, in our spherical coordinates, that z is rho cosine of phi. And the r in the xy plane was rho sine of phi. We had that in our diagram when I was writing down what spherical, what spherical coordinates are. Um, so, what is this equation? Well, this is x squared plus y squared. That's r squared. The square root of r squared is r. So in, as a, in cylindrical coordinates, as we saw before, that z equals r. But in spherical coordinates, that means it's rho cosine of phi equals rho sine of phi. Well, So either rho is zero and we're at the origin, well, that's just one point, we'll take that into account in a minute, or cosine of phi equals sine of phi. But cosine of phi equals sine of phi, and phi is between zero and pi, there's only one place where that happens, and that's at pi over four. Um, so this is the same as saying phi is pi over four, which already includes, so we get, Cosine of phi equals sine of phi, but since phi is between 0 and pi, this implies phi equals pi over 4. This includes that rho could be 0, because at the origin where rho is 0, the origin is the only place where the distance from the origin is 0, <clears throat> you can have any theta and any phi. So um, phi equals pi over 4 includes the origin where rho would be 0. All right. So that's why 
this cone that you're seeing is exactly specified by phi equals pi over 4. Um, all right, or half cone that you're seeing. Great, so this is the triple, the iterated integral that we need to do. And now you just do this, and we should get what we got before in cylindrical coordinates. If we don't, well, that's a problem. And this is slightly, you'll see that this will be slightly easier than what we did in cylindrical coordinates, because in cylindrical coordinates, we had to make a substitution at one point. It wasn't a particularly difficult substitution. Nonetheless, this is slightly easier. You get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 4. Uh, the inside integral, again, is with respect to rho. So you get rho cubed over 3 um, times sine of phi. And rho goes from 0 to the square root of 8. And then you still have to integrate with respect to phi and theta. When you plug in the square root of 8, you get the square root of 8 cubed. That's 8 times the square root of 8. Um, when you plug in rho, you get 0. So you get 8 times the square root of 8 over 3 at times sine of phi. We'll pull out the 8 times the square root of 8 over 3. We still have the integral from 0 to 2 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 4, sine of phi, d phi, d theta. And then you do the integrals we did, well, that we kind of had to do in the last problem. You get the integral of sine of phi is minus cosine of phi. So you get minus the cosine of phi. Evaluated from 0 to pi over 4. And then you'll have to integrate with respect to theta. So you get 8 times the square root of 8. Um, maybe I'll go ahead and do it now, since our other problem was in terms of the square root of 2, and this one will be 2. Square root of 8 is the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. The square root of 4 is 2, so this is 16 times the square root of 2 over 3. We get the integral from 0 to 2 pi of minus the cosine of pi over 4 is 1 over the square root of 2. So we get minus 1 over the square root of 2 minus minus what you get at 0, which is plus 1. And then you still have to integrate with respect to theta. So we are getting 16 times the square root of 2 over 3. And then this is just a constant times 1 minus 1 over the square root of 2 times 2 pi. And if you, if you put the 2 pi over here, you get 32 pi over 3. You get 32 pi over 3. And I'll put that square root of 2. I'll multiply it inside here and get the square root of 2 minus 1. Which, <laughs> if you look back, <laughs> is exactly the same thing that we got when we did this in cylindrical coordinates. 32 pi over 3 times the square root of 2 minus 1. And this is slightly easier. There are no substitutions involved, but then you have to see that this solid region, this snow cone, is nicely described in spherical coordinates. Anyway, you'll get, you know, there's no substitute like doing a bunch of problems, and if you do a bunch of problems with spherical coordinates, you'll get more used to them. How often do they come up? Well, when regions kind of look spherical. <laughs> it's, um, it takes some practice to see when it's nice, but frequently it's obvious when there's a sphere involved and something's trapped between a sphere, you might at least think about whether you want to use spherical coordinates. We'll see more applications of these in later sections where we calculate average value, mass given density, centers of mass, moments of inertia. So we'll have more practice with spherical and cylindrical coordinates later.